biting my tongue uh, the first part of the discussion because there are a number of topics that came up that I'll be touching on and uh, you know no final word on any of this stuff but um, I had titled this presentation red wine and spaghetti sort of tongue-in-cheek red wine being a euphemism for the consistency of model paint that you want to achieve to get it working through your airbrush and We'll talk about the spaghetti here in a little bit, but a little dinner time conversation on airbrushing equipment and methods. And what I wanted to do is um, talk about my experiences with airbrushes. You know, I've worked with lots of different ones. They all have different pluses and minuses. And a lot of it sometimes comes down to what works best in an individual person's hand. But there are some generalizations and epiphanies that I've come to that uh, I think are pertinent. And I hope that for folks that have already been airbrushing for a while, there'll be some nuggets here that you can use to think about the equipment that you already have. If you're looking at getting uh, a new airbrush, then certainly some things to think about. And certainly if there's anybody that wants to airbrush but hasn't bought anything, then there'll be a lot of, I think, useful information here. So first generalization I wanna talk about is that when it comes to airbrushing and modeling, size matters. Now. What am I talking about here? Well, it really comes down to the aperture. And this came up in the discussion at the beginning of the meeting. Um, these are a series of needles for two of the common single action airbrushes, the Pache Model H and the Badger 200. And what they have in common, and single action airbrushes are often recommended as a good beginner airbrush. And I think the reason why, one of the reasons why that is the case is that they all have a common uh, feature, which is a relatively large aperture. These range anywhere from uh, 0.65 to, in the case of some of the larger tips on the Fashion Model H, uh, almost one millimeter. And the reason that's important is that almost all airbrushes were not originally designed to paint model, to put paint on models. They were art tools designed for artists to do artwork like this, and some may consider that a higher calling, I don't know. But before the days of Photoshop, when you could do these types of fades and transitions, they would use the airbrushes to, to do that type of uh, toning. And they were used to spray inks on paper, and the pigments in inks are much, much finer than any of the common hobby paints. So when you think about the tip size in the opening, you want something of sufficient size to allow the paint to throw, flow through. Another thing to think about is the shape of the needle. So it's the size, but also the shape that's important. If you look at on the left, the Pache Model H needle, you'll see that it comes to a, a taper very quickly and it starts out very thick, whereas the Badger 200 needle is uh, much longer and tapers much more gradually. And the reality is that those two needles are gonna throw paint off in very different ways with the, the more quickly tapering needle on the Pache, it's gonna have a coarser atomization, whereas you get a much finer spray pattern. And here's a, a picture of the two airbrushes and the needles that they go with. The one on the bottom, the Pache Model H, is really one of the first airbrush designs that was ever produced. And it's very simple. It uh, mixes the paint in the air outside of the actual airbrush and, and the needle and, and cone assembly is all external. The, Badger 200 is a more modern design. The needle goes all the way through the body and the paint uh, and air actually mixing inside the airbrush as they're sprayed out. But that finer atomization quality is something that you wanna think about, uh, particularly in, in instances where you can benefit from a, a, a finer spray pattern. And I'm thinking specifically about alkyl metallics where the metallic will show any undulation in the surface. And so the Badger 200 is a, a great option for that. In fact, Alclad has their own version manufactured by Badger of that airbrush uh, that they recommend for spraying their finishes. Also, if you need a really smooth primer surface, it's a good option. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that in the case of a lot of the single action airbrushes and, and some double action, many of them are what they call siphon feed, which means that you're working out of a reservoir and you're pulling paint from the reservoir all the way up through this tube to the tip. And there are pluses and minuses to that. One issue with this is that in order to have any paint coming out the tip, you've basically got to have paint from about a quarter of the color cup all the way through this tube to the tip. Now, 
that may not seem like a big deal, but you'll be amazed at how much paint you can actually, or how much coverage you can get with just the amount of paint from the bottom of that reservoir to the tip. And in instances where, I mean, I think you could cover the bottom of a 70 second scale airplane with that amount of paint, frankly. And in instances with some of the modern paints like Vallejo, where you're actually literally mixing by the drop, you can waste a lot of material in this type of airbrush. But having said that, once you learn how to work through the intricacies of the airbrush, even with a simple tool like the Pache Model H, you can get some really good results. And just as an experiment, because this was the first airbrush that I, I had ever gotten, I painted up this 70 second scale uh, Airfix Dauntless and all the paintwork that you see with the exception of the figures was done with that airbrush, including the clear coat. So they're really uh, capable tools. Uh, you just have to think about how to get the best out of them. And in some instances, like putting the clear coats on, a trusty single action airbrush is actually ideal. Now, moving on to the double action versus the single action airbrushes. Again, here, size really matters. And there are just a few key attributes that I think are critical for a good double action airbrush. The first is gravity feed because of that issue of being able to mix small quantities and being very efficient in your use of material. You also wanna have a good smooth trigger action. And this is one of the instances where getting a feel for it is gonna be really important. Uh, this is, happens to be in a water revolution. Uh, and this is my sort of go-to airbrush for general model painting. Um, there are lots of features that you can start tacking on and they go up in price. So the Pache Model H you can get for as little as $39. Uh, I've seen for the Badger 200, you're starting to push $100. With the Revolution and getting into the double action, it's $119. And then for a little more money, you can start bringing on additional features. This is an Awada HPC at the bottom. And that's when you start bringing in things like the crown tip, which is intended to reduce some of the distortion uh, and air vortices at the end of the tip. Uh, it's nice, but I think we'll see a little bit later that it's, it's probably not all that useful. Uh, you also have the ability for a preset handle that will allow you to restrict how much paint comes out, um, which can be helpful. And you pick up some ergonomic uh, bells and whistles here, and you're adding on about another $50 to $75 to the cost of the airbrush. But what's really important, and I come back to it, is the aperture. And I know this was discussed at the beginning of the conversation too. So on the left, you see the water revolution. That's got a 0 0.5 half a millimeter aperture. The HPC is a point, oops, sorry, uh, go back. The HPC is uh, 0.35. And I know there was discussion about some of the uh, uh, Grex airbrushes uh, that come standard 0.2. I would say that 0.3 millimeters is about the smallest that you can really safely go for a general purpose airbrush that's going to run most of the common hobby paints. So you really want to focus on that. And um, the other issue that you run into is the shape of the needle, which is going to have sort of the same impact. You can see the at the top, the water revolution needle tapers relatively quickly compared to uh, a much longer and finer taper for one of the more advanced airbrushes. Now, is the ability for that finer uh, um, aerialization of the paint going to matter? Well, in most cases not, but there's some instances where it could be a factor. And, and particularly what I'm thinking about is the times when you have to do a very tight feathered edge between camouflage colors, uh, like here on the, the Memphis belt. And if you look at the process of the actual airplane being painted, a few things really leap out at me. The first is the relatively fine atomization from the spray gun that they're using, and then looking at how closely they're holding that to the surface of the airplane. And if you scale that down to 148th or 172nd scale, that is literally right on the surface, you know, within fractions of an inch. And, and frankly, to reproduce that, that's a, about a distance that you need to think about using and you're really gonna benefit from the tighter pattern from a, a thinner, more tapered, uh, gradually tapered needle. Another area where it comes in handy is when you have a relatively tight edge camouflage pattern, like these dark green blotches that are irregular in shape. And that's where uh, a good double action airbrush really comes into its own. 
but thinking through and, and having access to the right type of needle will help that process uh, significantly. And then again, you know, watching them put the blotches on, again, you look at that uh, paint gun and it is right on the surface. And that's something that, you know, never really occurred to me when I was trying things. And, and since I focused on it, it makes a big difference for these types of really tight feathered edges. So with that in mind, let me tell you a little bit, uh, a story, a little bit of uh, painful history, and which I call how not to buy an airbrush. So I guess about 2007, I came across a series of articles by a fellow by the name of Andrew Dextrous. And even now, I think this is some of the best paint work that I've ever seen. I, I still love it, the, the weathered, buried finish, uh, the, the post shading that he was able to do. And in looking around and finding some other articles, you know, again, just this is something that I still aspire to in the work that I'm trying to do. And so diving into the articles, I really focused on this sentence. The model was painted using Gunzi and Tamiya acrylics with my custom Micron B and then post shaded with Tamiya acrylics. Well, what I saw out of that sentence is this, they want a custom Micron B. What I should have focused on, what's equally important, is that the model was painted with that airbrush with Gunzi and Tamiya acrylics, but I didn't make that connection. So I forged out all excited and uh, ended up tracking down an Awada custom Micron C airbrush. And, you know, this thing is all that in a bag of chips. It's got the sexy crown tip. It's got the micro air control valve. It's got these cutouts, which I still don't know what purpose they serve, but they sure look cool. And so I got it and threw some model master paint in and started trying to paint a model and no paint would come out and I'm trying to figure out what the heck is going on because I spent uh, a pretty good chunk of money on it came to find out that the custom micron series the aperture size is only 0.2 tenths of a millimeter and if you look at it in comparison to that revolution aperture it's like a, a howitzer compared to a bb gun and the reality is that Gunzi and Tamiya uh, paints are probably the only paints that would work successfully with that airbrush. Maybe some of the uh, MRP paints uh, that are out there, but you're really limiting yourself in terms of what you can do. Now, I contrast that with a, a more recent experience. I was at one of the nationals a few years ago, and they had a booth uh, where they were selling the Harder and Steenbeck airbrushes. And I actually had a chance to use the airbrush and just fell in love with the trigger action and the way that it performed and was very happy with it. And so I stress, if you're looking at uh, buying an airbrush, if there's any opportunity to actually use it, take advantage of it. And with a club like this, with so many people, chances are somebody probably has the airbrush you're interested in. And I know in my case, I'm certainly happy, you know, when we hopefully get back to the ability for in-person interactions to, to bring a brush out and, and let folks try it. But that's the acid test because even after all of these concepts and, and things that I'm talking about, it's a very individual type of situation. And there are some airbrushes that I've never been able to use successfully, the, the testers Aztec being one of them, and I've tried several times. Others get great finishes, some of the best model paint work I've ever seen, like Chris Wokup, who's a frequent poster on hyperscale, uh, they use the Aztec, but never worked for me. But once I got the, the harder steam back back, I realized there were some features that I didn't even realize that I'd gotten at the time that are really important. One being, it actually comes with two different needles and tips. And one is a 0.4 tenths of a millimeter size, which is a great size for general airbrush work. And then it's got a finer tapered needle and a 0.15 uh, aperture, which is great for some of the, the detailed post shading work that you can do with the Timmy acrylic paints. But even more importantly, you look at the tip and you'll see that their tip cover is really just two prongs. Now, that's a little risky from a standpoint of protecting the needle. But again, when it comes to the covering of the tip for fine work, less is definitely more, as we'll see a little bit later. Maybe ideally not having any cover at all is helpful, but certainly this is uh, an approach that minimizes any of the, the impacts of tip vortices for fine detail work. So uh, the reality is that I learned that that one airbrush can basically do all of the things that the Iwata HBC and the custom Micron C were able to do for about a third of the cost of those two airbrushes. But 
there was even an opportunity to economize that I didn't realize. Uh, the Harder and Steenbeck runs about $300. Um, but it, it comes with a built-in micro air control valve at the base of the airbrush. And I use a rig where I'm using quick disconnects with a, this is manufactured by Grex that has a micro air control valve right at where the airbrush connects. So you really don't need that. And I learned later that Harder and Steenbeck makes a series of airbrushes called the Evolution that have all the features that were important to me in terms of the, the ability to control the paint, uh, and uh, the, the trigger action and the two different size of needles and tips, but it's about $80 less than the Infinity because it doesn't have the microcontrol valve. So it's really useful to think about your setup, the equipment that you have, and look at the features of an airbrush that you're interested in, make sure you're not buying more than you need. I wanted to talk a little bit about troubleshooting the Iwata. There was an issue that one of the, the folks on the DC club had raised about bubbling back in the Iwata cup. And I think this would probably hold true for the Grex. I have a couple of Grex airbrushes and they're very similar designs to the Iwatas. And there was a concern that maybe that was a result of the seal, uh, the needle bearing being bad, which certainly a possibility, but you'd have to use an airbrush an awful lot to wear out one of those needle bearings. But what I have seen is any type of clog in the small tips that they have at the end of the airbrush can, can cause real problems. So when I am tearing down my airbrushes and cleaning them, I always hold the tip up to a strong source of light. And if I can see metal glinting off of the inside of that tip, then I know it's clean and clear. If not, then I know there's probably some dry paint in there. And Badger makes a airbrush cleaning needle, which is basically a regular airbrush needle with half of the tip ground off, it allows you to gently get inside that really small tip and scrape out any uh, contamin paint contaminants that may be in there. You have to be really careful so that you don't jam it in too far because you can actually distort the end of the tip and then that'll cause the paint not to come out right. But it's a really useful tool for dealing with uh, those airbrushes that use that really, really small tip. Another thing that's important is making sure that the the seal between the tip and the body of the airbrush is completely airtight. And a way to ensure that is to get some beeswax, which Badger also makes. And all you need to do is take a little kerf of it off with the tip of a toothpick and wrap that around the threads of the tip, being careful to not get any wax inside the tip because you'll cause other problems. And then just gently screw it down. You don't want to over tighten these. I've, I've broken off, one off in the airbrush, uh, cranking down too much, but the wax will squeeze out and then you know that you've got an airtight seal and you can just knock off the excess with the tip of the toothpick. Next, I wanna talk about thinning, which is sort of one of these chores with airbrushing that's sort of the airbrush equivalent of filling and sanding seams. You have to do it to get the airbrush to work, but it, it can be a little messy and a little bit of a pain. Um, as it relates to thinners, there's sort of a general rule that uh, the proprietary thinners for whatever brand of paint you're using are the best option. And I don't disagree with that, but there are some opportunities to economize that may be worth thinking about. In the case of enamels and lacquers, regular uh, hardware store lacquer thinner uh, from Home Depot really works well. And for sure for cleaning, uh, it's a lot more economical to spray this stuff through than the, uh, the proprietary uh, thinners that you know, are, are, are quite expensive. You can pick up a gallon of this for just a few bucks. It's also generally uh, useful for thinning a lot of enamel paints uh, if you need to do that. And it's also a good interim cleaner for even acrylics. Uh, occasionally I'll have a little bit of a blockage. The, the acrylics are being a little finicky. So if I spray all the acrylic out and just put a cup full of this through the airbrush, it evaporates in just a few seconds and it'll usually clear things out enough for me to get through the painting session. For thinning acrylics, there's a formula that I found on one of the sites that was talked about earlier and was part of the survey, which is Genesis Models. And they've got a great video on a homebrew thinner recipe that I've tried out and really like. And it's, uh, it's pretty simple. It's mixed by volume, two thirds uh, quantity of of distilled water, one third of isopropyl alcohol. You wanna make sure that you get the 99% variety and then just a small amount, one millimeter of uh, milliliter of Flow-Aid by Liquitex. 
and one milliliter of retarder, in this case, Golden, but Liquifix also makes it. You can buy all of these ingredients at art stores, uh, or in the case of the alcohol, I ordered it through Amazon and I priced it out. And if you got one, everything you see here would run you about $84. Now for that amount of money, you can buy about seven bottles of Tamiya's X28 thinner. And this amount of material will give you about 64 bottles of uh, thinner, uh, eight ounce bottles of thinner and about 20 bottles of the cleaner that I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. So you can see that there's some significant economization opportunities. Having said that, for really fine detail work and for post shading, I find that the X20 thinner works just a hair better for those applications. So I will save the X20 for, for those, but if I'm painting a bomb, or landing gear or you know, putting a base coat of uh, interior color on a model or a tank, I will use the homebrew thinner for sure. The other nice thing about it is that it's very versatile. I've used it successfully with a wide range of acrylic brands. Uh, I never really found anything that worked well, even testers own proprietary thinner for their aqua paint. But once I tried it with this stuff, I actually was able to airbrush it. I know it's not being manufactured anymore, but um, a lot of people still have uh, it on their shelves. It also works with Polyscale, as well as Tamiya and Vallejo. Uh, we also talked a, a little bit about clear coats and uh, I am a big fan of uh, Future for clear coats, but one of the things that I just wanted to pass on is I found that it lays down just uh, uh, significantly better if you put a drop or two of either X20A, which is what I first tried, and more recently have moved to Mr. Color Leveling Thinner. It's not really thinning it per se, but I think those additives really break down the surface tension and allow the acrylic to settle down and level out, and uh, I've got a much better finish. I've not tried it, but I suspect that it would have the same effect for the aqua gloss, and again, it's not thinning it, but if you put just a drop or two in a color cup of the other of the aqua gloss before you lay it down, it'd be worth uh, worth trying out. It definitely works well for the future. Uh, another alternative for clear coats, uh, while I agree aqua gloss is a great product, I had been uh, previously using the testers dull coat and gloss coat lacquer products, and with testers sort of exiting the market was interested in uh, an alternative. And so there's a great little hobby shop in Fayetteville, North Carolina, that uh, I stop whenever I'm going back and forth to Savannah and they recommended the AK uh, clear coats. And in the case of the ultra matte varnish, that's the, the only uh, equivalent that I found uh, in an acrylic or frankly, any alternative to Chester's dull coat that gives you a really super smooth, nice matte completely matte finish. And so I've really fallen in love with it. They also make a semi-matte and gloss varnishes and they thin with, uh, to me, airbrush thinner, uh, or Vallejo airbrush thinner, I should say. And uh, so definitely uh, recommend you, you give it a try if you get a chance. So Rafe, are you talking about Hayes Hobbies in Fayetteville? I am, yes. Yeah, it's a good shop, I've been there. Yeah, I, I, I love it. It's uh, a little bit of a, a jog off of 95, but uh, to my wife's dismay, I, I hit it going and coming every time. Uh, next, I'll talk a little bit about the process of dispensing. And this is what I was really talking, thinning is not so much the pain, but dispensing without creating a huge mess can, can be a little bit of a headache. And you know, there are lots of different ways to do it. I've used pipettes. They work great, but you still have to get them cleaned out. And I found that if you just use a toothpick, you can pour directly out of the bottle and the paint will run along the toothpick directly down into whatever area you need it to go uh, almost every, every time. Um, you can also use the tip of a Tamiya stirrer if you're talking about mixing up just small quantities. And like I mentioned, if you've got a gravity feed airbrush, three or four drops of paint uh, and uh, three or four drops of thinner is all you need to do an awful lot of coverage if you're talking about a bomb or an instrument panel. So it allows you to be much more efficient with your material. What I found that was really helpful was to mix the paint up in uh, communion uh, serving glasses. Uh, you wanna make sure you get the glass kind. You can track these down at a religious bookstore or on Amazon and uh, they're relatively inexpensive, but they taper to the bottom. So it gives you the ability to mix really small amounts of paint and, and really be efficient. So once you add the paint in the jar, you can add the thinner with the, the pipette. You don't have to worry about cleaning up. 
stir it up with a scrap neoprene brush and then use the same toothpick to pour the mixed paint into the airbrush. I've seen videos where people have mixed thinner and paint inside the color cup of the airbrush. I, I don't recommend that. It's probably one of those things where, you know, 70% of the time you can get away with it, but it's easy to have a little glob of unthinned paint get into the tip and sort of blow you up and then you have to tear the airbrush down. So I think it's a much better option to mix the paint and thinner outside and then transfer it to the airbrush. So with all that having been said, wanted to talk about putting a lot of this theory into practice. So I guess about a year and a half ago, I felt like I needed a, a simple project to tackle that uh, hopefully would be a, a good way to clear my head. And so I looked at this Hobbycraft uh, BF109G in 48 scale that I had sitting on my shelf. And I thought, this will be great. It's only about 60 or 70 parts. It ought to slam together really quickly. And, and I like the camouflage scheme. And I didn't really think twice about it. Um, and my friend Brian had a, a book that had a good reference picture of it. And I said, oh, yeah, it's just spaghetti scruples. You know, you can do that. I do that in my sleep. Well, I came to find out that getting a consistent, even line perfectly placed is way harder than uh, it looks. And so this was one of my early attempts. And after mixing different thinner ratios and combinations, I finally got to the point where I could at least get a consistent line. Uh, getting it in the right place is a whole other story, which I'll talk about. But uh, I wanted to share that thinning ratio. And, and one other thing that you may want to think about uh, in terms of your paints for specific applications, to me is an acrylic lacquer, which means it'll reduce with the Tamiya X20A and, and even water, um, although I don't recommend water for, for thinning it for airbrushing. Uh, but it's also uh, reducible with lacquer thinner. And one of the advantages of lacquer thinner is that lacquer thinner will, will reliquify the paint at the tip of the airbrush. So you have much less of a tip dry problem than you do with the X20A thinner. Uh, another thing that's come on the market relatively recently is a paint retarder that Tamiya makes, which uh, further extends the drying time and really, for me, let me get a consistent line that I could spray for you know, 20 or 30 seconds at a time, as opposed to getting stoppages after just a couple seconds. And the ratio is pretty specific. I did a lot of experimentation and it's eight drops of the Tamiya paint, four drops of the lacquer thinner and one drop of the Tamiya retarder. Uh, I think for those that are using the MRP paints, they may be able to bypass this because they are lacquer based and you get sort of the benefit of that. Um, the next step is to figure out how to get the paint where it needs to go on the model. And so uh, again, doing some research, I found a really helpful video that I can't recommend highly enough. I got so many insights out of this one video that um, uh, I really hope you get a chance to check it out. But I wanted to share a few of the key takeaways for me. Uh, the first is uh, I was chuckling that he was using the, the was that they want a custom micron C. So uh, a little bit of a blast of the past, but you'll notice that that, that really nifty crown regulator crown tip is uh, off and uh, he speaks to this and you really for super fine detail work just don't want to have anything over the needle you got to be very careful and if you drop it you're going to bend your needle for sure but you're going to get the best results if there's nothing that can interfere with the airflow over the tip the other thing that you'll notice is that he's using a two-hand hold which for super fine work is really helpful now obviously you need to find a way to uh, mount the model because you can't hold the model and two hands on the airbrush at the same time. In my case, I worked up an arrangement of um, pillows and some uh, uh, rags so that I could support the model and bunch it up to hold it in place. But it really made a big difference with this two hand hold. The other thing that you'll notice is that he's got the airbrush hose wrapped around his wrist. And another thing that I found from, from working through this is the hose, if there's any kind of snag or you're you accidentally put your foot on it and you're trying to move, any jar will create a visible uh, disturbance in, in the way the paint goes down on the model. So if you wrap the hose around your wrist one time, you can reduce uh, having any unexpected snags that'll cause you problems. The other thing is making sure that you've got a set distance away from the work. And uh, you see at the top line, he's spraying probably six or seven inches off the surface and it's very wide. There's a lot of diffusion around it. 
when he's just uh, an inch or two uh, off the paper, he gets that thin line that you need. And he's actually using his finger as a spacer so that the tip of the airbrush stays, stays an exact distance from the surface. And that's not really practical for trying to paint a tank or an airplane because of all the complex curves, but that concept of making sure that you keep the tip of the airbrush the exact same distance away from the model for any type of work like this. And it's not just fine lines, it's also if you're doing like a fine demarcation line or you're doing some of those camouflage patterns with the tight edge, you gotta keep the distance uh, very exact and very close to the surface of the model. And then it's also critically important to make sure that you're moving the airbrush all the time and that the airbrush is in motion before you start the air, then you start the paint, then you stop the paint and then you stop the air after you got gotten off the surface of the model. And if you don't do that, if there's any hesitation, you'll get what he refers to as dog bones, which uh, I certainly uh, had a lot of uh, problems with when I was first starting out. And the other thing is you got to constantly bat tip dry. I think to bat tip dry, I think it's an issue even with um, the lacquer paints and even with this mixture that I did with the lacquer thinner, it would it clog up. So proactively every 90 seconds or two minutes, I just got in the habit of clearing the tip. And if you do that, you can see over on the left, you can get extremely consistent, minute, you know, almost the size of a, uh, a pencil point dots with uh, an airbrush like this, as long as that tip stays clean. And so, Packing all that together, I realized that, you know, there are sort of two options that would be good choices for re reproducing that, that finish. The first is the Infinity uh, by Harder and Steenbeck or the Custom Micron C. And so working with it, um, I got good results. But for me, the other imperative is that you really got to practice. Now, I know that there are probably some protégés out there that can pick up an airbrush and get a great result uh, right out of, the, out of the gate. but I am not one of those people. So what I did was come up with a practice sheet and uh, I've also provided this to uh, the Mike for posting on the website. And what I wanted to do was get into the habit of working, starting the air and then the paint and keeping the airbrush in motion. So that the, the objective here with these parallel vertical lines is to start the paint at the first line, I'm sorry, start the air at the first line keeping a consistent even motion across, start the paint on the second line, stop the paint on the third line and stop the air on the fourth line and be able to do that over and over and over and over again until it becomes second nature. And then once you sort of got a handle on that, I created just some basic shapes that approximated the shape of the wing so that I could focus on getting a very specific squiggle shape into a very particular area. And after working about 45 minutes or so a night, for about a week and a half, I was able to get a result that I was pretty happy with. And um, it, uh, it, it really helped. Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to do practice for a week and a half before you, every model build, but I do think that you're gonna need to put that amount of time into your brush at least once so you really learn how to use it and also learn where the break is on the trigger, where the paint starts to come out. And, the more precise you can be, the better. And, and for me, it, it did become a little bit like riding a bike in second nature, although I'll keep the sheet out and every once in a while, you know, before I start painting, uh, I'll go ahead and run through these uh, exercises just to uh, make sure that I keep that, that hand-eye coordination going in, in my brain. The next step was to uh, focus on putting the, the squiggles in the exact right shape. So I blew up uh, to 48 scale, uh, some plans of a 109 outline and did that for a couple of days. And after all that, um, was able to get a good result. But the other thing that's really important to do is also to practice on a model, a painted model, because paper is more absorbent than uh, plastic. And while you definitely want to use a, a matte finish for your undercoat to create some of that textured effect and absorbency that paper has, it's gonna be just a little bit different. So there's a little bit of relearning that you need to do in order to make sure that everything you're incorporating is gonna work out right on the actual model. So I just had a couple scrap kits that I practiced on. So after all that, 
you know, after a couple of weeks worth of practicing and figuring things out, uh, I was able to knock out the camouflage in about 10 minutes on the model and um, ended up with a result that I was really happy with. So hopefully that's uh, helpful in terms of if you're struggling with something, sort of how to approach it systematically. Lastly, I'll talk a little bit about cleaning. Um, I wanted to, and this came up too, the, the, the issue of uh, problems with Windex. And I actually got into a little bit of a testy exchange with one of the regulars on hyperscale who was adamant that there's no problem with uh, putting Windex through an airbrush. It's a great cleaner for acrylic paints, but um, what I found is when I got my water airbrushes, the color cups were nicely chromed inside. And with that revolution, after about a year and a half of using it, and I was at that point also using Windex as a thinner for some of the acrylic paints. It, it, it's a okay thinner for uh, the model master aqua paints. Um, you started seeing a good bit of brass showing at the bottom of the color cup and, and leads you to wonder what's going on in the internals. And just to show that it's not a fluke, <clears throat> this is a, another brush I have that I used for about a half a year and you can start seeing the brass appearing around the, the bottom of the airbrush there as well. I mentioned that uh, there's a, a, a non-ammonia homebrew cleaning recipe that I came across and I can't remember where this site was, but so I don't claim credit for it, but again, it's very economical and easy to make. It's just uh, a half and half mixture of distilled water and windshield washer fluid that you can get from any uh, gas station and then uh, just an ounce of the 99% isopropyl alcohol and then a little bit of milliliter of the glycerin. Um, and that has the effect of providing a little bit of lubrication for the internals of the airbrush. You can get the glycerin at Michael's or I think it's at grocery stores. You can also get it on Amazon. And again, you can make up heaps of uh, eight ounce bottles of this with what you see here for very inexpensively and, and it works great as an alternative. In terms of tearing the airbrush down uh, and tools, you know, I think it's helpful to get a set of uh, cleaning brushes, but you can get most of the uh, work you need to do for cleaning the airbrush out with interdental brushes that are available at any uh, uh, drugstore, Rite Aid or what have you. You, know, you need a pack of them for just a few bucks. And, for me, this is about as far down as I will tear down uh, a double action airbrush. You can get toolkits uh, that will allow you to you know, take the internals of the trigger mechanisms and springs apart. I've never really found it necessary to do that. And, and taking it down this far, you can pretty much get everywhere that you need to get uh, to get any dry paint out of it. Uh, but the biggest revelation that I had with regard to cleaning airbrushes is that you don't really need to do it that often. And this actually came from one of the, the people that I met at Nova, uh, Mike Wachowski, who, who is a professional airbrush artist. And he said, you know, we never clean our airbrushes, you know, every day or every week, particularly with acrylics. If you're using uh, that, that their acrylic paints and keeping in mind that the drying process is a chemical reaction based on exposure to air, when you're done painting, uh, whatever you're working on, if you blow a couple of capfuls of that cleaning mixture through until it comes out clear, and then put, you know, a third of a cup of the homebrew cleaner of the homebrew thinner rather in, and spray it out so that it's all the way through from the color cup through the internals of the airbrush and stop and leave a little bit in the reservoir, you can set that on a hook and come back to it, you know, days or even weeks later, and it's going to be fine. And even if the thinners evaporated, as long as there's a metal to metal seal between the needle and the tip, it's gonna work pretty well for you. So now I'll go, you know, uh, multiple weeks, even a couple months between tearing down the airbrush. So I usually sort of only tear it down after I've completed the model, just again, as a little process of clearing my head. So that's about all I have uh, for this evening. Uh, here's my email address. I put it in the chat box too. Um, I'm totally happy to answer any questions tonight, but if anything pops up later on, uh, I, I love talking about this stuff. So please feel free to reach out and appreciate the invitation to be here. Yeah, uh, Rafe, just let me point out those in that next to last slide, you showed your cleaning implements and one was a little ring with all the little brushes on it. Yeah, right there, that, that top set of brushes. If you go on to torrentonbrush.company.com,
you can buy those brushes by individual sizes with nylon nylon bristles. So you, you know the one that's showing there, you can get it, you know, a Harbor Freight tool, any place like that. But if you want to buy the individual sizes that'll work for your specific brush, like there's a big difference between a Pache and a Harbor Steam Bag. You can buy those individual sizes um, on Torrington Brush Company. It's a great company. You get them in like a day and a half, two days, even now. That's really neat. That's great. Um, I, I will check that out for sure. Yeah. Hey, Mike, can you put that a link to that up on the uh, website, up on the uh, maybe on the, the tip section or something? Yeah. Well, no, what I'll do is I'll put it right underneath where I'm going to put Rafe's presentation. Okay, good. 